Welcome back to the channel. My name is Shanna. I'm a Canadian medical student, and this is a channel for mostly pre-med advice, but some advice for medical students. So today I am super excited to have one of my best friends ever, Amy, on this channel. Um, she is going to help us talk about some questions to explore whether medical school is the right choice for you or maybe something else is better. And in particular, we're going to discuss grad school, but she is a grad student in medical biophysics at the University of Toronto, and she did her undergrad in neuroscience in Toronto previous to that. You guys should check out her blog on time management. It's called wanderaimlessly.com. Shout out to Matthew for leaving this video idea in the comments. The majority of people who initially consider med school don't actually end up going to med school because they don't actually find they like medicine or a different career is a better fit because obviously I'm biased as a med school and I think it's the best career ever. I think it's the best career ever for a particular type of person. And I think other careers are the best fit for a particular type of person. And what made you interested in medicine initially? Like science, like in high school, I loved biology. So I knew I liked that sort of stuff. And so I went into undergrad to, you know, further develop and explore. And I really liked neuroscience and I, I liked science, right? I think that's how a lot of people get started on this path. I think most people have like two paths in their head. It's like med school or some kind of like professional school, like dentistry or something like that, or like more academia research, right? And it seems like there's only two options. Me interested in medicine was that I like the impact, like you'd be making really real impact, literally saving lives, right? Mm -hmm. And so you could really make a real difference in the world and people's lives. And so that was what interested me to medicine. Okay, when people are first in like say their first year of medicine or they just came from high school, I think it's okay to just have this vague idea. Like I like science. Like I think yeah. you don't need to start off right away knowing that you need to you you know that you're gonna become aggressive in medical biophysics, like or you you know specifically you're gonna be like a cardiothoracic surgeon. Like I think most right. people yeah. They're definitely, in fact, I don't think you should have that pressure. In fact, I think if you have that pressure too early on, you're like kind of putting yourself in a hole and kind of putting on blinders to all these other amazing options. And what made you like decide that you kind of didn't really like medicine anymore or that started pulling you towards like grad school? As self-exploration and getting to know myself better and what exactly I liked. And so what really, the I guess the three things that really made me realize was one, um, I really value my freedom. I like having the flexibility to choose what my hours are. Not that I would work less hours, but to choose when exactly I do those things. Um, also, I want, I like the flexibility in the science because um, for medicine, it's a lot more your patients dictate what you do and what direction you go in. But I like the exploration and the curiosity and um, uh, of science, like pushing the boundaries of what we know and what we don't know. That was really exciting for me. Um, and I find that for me, the best moments in research is when you have been working on something and you make a breakthrough. And then with that breakthrough, you're like, I did not expect this finding. Now what? What's our next step? What's the next direction we want to go in? That for me was the most exciting part, that new, new, new spot. Um, and I felt like with medicine, because, you know, you're much more focused on the impact rather than basic research, um, you would be a little bit more constrained in what you can do, right? Um, the other things was I really was honest with myself in realizing that I'm not that much of a people person. I don't love dealing with people all the time and that I knew it would be really draining for me. And I don't think I could see myself interacting with people um, for the long term and not feeling like burnt out because of the people interactions. And then I also um, had a cl clinical research job in a palliative care lab and there was a lot of suffering and I know that's not the, you know, that's definitely not the case for all types of medicine, but that is uh, a reality of the profession, right? And I kind of realized that, you know, I can, I can understand and, you know, have empathy for those people, but maybe I just don't want to put myself in that situation um, very often. And so those were the, the main things that made me want to decide maybe other things would also be a very good option. I think all of those are actually very true of medicine. So, um, like, for example, about the freedom, um, you know, I think it's an amazing career, but definitely freedom is not one of these things, if that's right. a value in medicine. Like, there is a lot of freedom in, like, how you want to, if you want to go part-time and stuff. But, you know, I think we talk about exceptions. We want to talk about, like, the average person. So, like, for example, um, so, like, you do, you can take off, like, time for a vacation. You could work less hours. Um, I remember one of our tutors, he said um, he, he, in 40 years of practicing family medicine, he only took off 
he only went on vacation twice. Oh, uh, wow. Um, and that's okay, because he, he talked about it with so much excitement and pride that he did that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. that's, um, and again, a lot, of, a lot of physicians, especially this current generation, do take vacation, and they take vacation mm-hmm. multiple times a year. He also decided to deliver babies on the side of being a family physician. So for him, his entire life is, um, he wanted to be there for the babies, and right. he, because he, you, you know, you spend these like nine months prior, kind of, you know, helping coach mom through the whole pregnancy process. So he really wanted to be there for the babies, and so, so a lot of his life was, trying to basically plan his life around the patients. Again, what you said about like, it's kind of directed by your patients as opposed to self-directed. So I think that's a real thing to consider um, that he dictated his life. And I know that he's not the only one. I followed um, two other uh, physicians that help deliver babies and stuff. Um, and both of them did that too. They planned their lives around their patients' due dates and stuff, um, mm-hmm. which is okay because that's a, you know, a beautiful moment to be part of. But like your hours are dictated by when people are going to need to see you, when OR hours are, when your staff are going to work. I think if you don't love people, I think you should really go to another field. Because it's like not just people all the time. It's people, for example, your example of people that are suffering. Because you're kind of carrying like an emotional like load. And I think... Um, I think you do build yourself up to it. So I think my tolerance at the beginning of medical school compared to now is definitely different because um, it takes a bit of getting used to being able to listen to like a heavy story and then learning to like let it go. But yeah. I do think that's a real consideration. Um, there are fields like radiology comes to mind and pathology, but I think that's a big myth that they don't have people interaction and that um, they don't interact with patients directly, but they interact a lot with like colleagues. So it's like, um, you know, so you're a radiologist and you're just like checking out someone's CT scan of their chest. Um, you know, you're working together with the oncologist, you're working together with their family doctor, you're working together with um, maybe their surgeon or something like that. And it's like every decision kind of is working together, which is really nice. But the other thing that I also did not like was the repetitiveness. You would see a lot of people with like the flu, the cold, you know, like very normal stuff. And I did not want to see 50 patients in a day that all like 25 of them all had the same thing. You know, I also wanted the ability to like explore and kind of do that curiosity stuff. So that was another reason that it was not quite for me. Like I didn't really have a good spot for me that would kind of fulfill everything that I wanted. Whereas another thing like lab work, research, much more easily could. Yeah. And so that is just comparing your options, right? So it is 100% very repetitive, um, even if you do really cool work. So um, for example, if you're a general surgeon and you specialize in like colorectal cancer, that is kind of what you're going to do every day. Yeah. Um, but luckily for people like me, uh, my friend, um, we actually crave uh, consistency and repetitiveness. Um, maybe weird, but maybe good. Um, family doctors, this of your bread and butter is probably treating people with repeat hypertension, diabetes. Mm, yeah. uh, you know, the pro of that is you get quite comfortable with it because you start seeing it like so repetitively, but even in some very like highly specialized fields. So even in ophthalmology, your bread and butter, you're probably going to see mostly diabetic retinopathy kind of every day. Cataracts every day. It's going to be, um, you know, if you're an obs guy, it's going to be birth every day. Like yeah. there's, there'll be a few cases that are high risk or whatever, but they're not Luckily, not every case is going to be like yeah. a new, exciting case. Um, in medicine, if every single day was a brand new challenge, it would actually be very stressful. Mm-hmm. Um, you do need to. Otherwise, you feel like you would never know anything. If we could backpedal and you could give us an insight into like what you mean by the freedom of like what medicine that looks like and like maybe what a week like in your work look like and what you kind of do. Cause Certain labs, but I do find that they definitely are special cases certain labs do have very regimented like you start at 8 30 and you end at 7 there are some people like that but for the majority of you know my grad school friends the labs that i've been in they've never been like that it's been very chill you get to come in it's based there's usually a lab meeting like a weekly lab meeting and as long as you have stuff to present and you're showing that you're being productive they don't really care what time you come in Um, a girl in my lab comes in at seven in the morning each day and leaves whenever she finishes. So sometimes that's like two or three in the afternoon or she stays until eight. It depends. So you have a lot more freedom to coordinate with your own schedule. Um, Because I'm all about like working, doing things when you're the most productive, right? Because not everybody's a morning person. And so, you know, being able to use that to your advantage was important to me. But for me, a general week, 
I would, well, I would make a plan, like the questions or the experiments that I want to do um, Mm -hmm. at the beginning of the week. And so usually Monday through Wednesday or maybe Thursday, that would be like experiment stuff, experiment stuff. Um, And then Friday is usually when I do my journal reading, I'll also analyze my data. But I normally, for me, I start at around like 830 Mm -hmm. and then I just go till whenever I finish. Like some days I do finish really early and I don't find the need to stick around. Um, Mm -hmm. So I'll like leave at two. But it really just depends on what um, what experiments you're running. And also it varies very much from field to field. Mm -hmm. Like for me, I do structural biology. And so there's a lot of like protein purification. So you have to grow up some protein and then you have to purify it. So that's usually like three very full days. Um, whereas like if you're in a genetics lab, you're probably doing a lot of these different PCRs or different cloning that'll take, that'll take multiple days. So you might go in like at 10 o'clock every morning, do your couple hours of work and then you're done. And then you just repeat that you know, throughout the entire week. So it really depends. I'm curious about like, it sounds like you have like a lot of self-direction, like um, how, like, how do your projects go? Do you like come up with your own idea and then decide like what tasks? It also depends on where in your scientific career you are. So I started my, I started my master's degree right now. I'm in the master's program. Um, I started my master's in January in this, in my permanent lab. And uh, he did have a project idea for me and I was okay with it. So I started that. And then I kept working on it. I, you know, it was pretty self-directed. I got to choose, you know, my supervisor had some ideas. He would always, you know, just email them to me. And so I have this long list of ideas. Mm -hmm. Um, But I get, I'm the one that gets to pick and choose, okay, which ones, which leads do I want to prioritize and try out first and see if they work? Um, What is not really worth my time? Like there's a lot of freedom in that way. Um, and then in March was when, it, when we realized that first approach really was not working. And so we shifted to a different organism. Mm-hmm. Um, and those big decisions, I guess, usually happen between you and your supervisor. Mm-hmm. But then the little stuff, like what experiments do you want to do? How, what specific constructs do you want to create and why? Mm-hmm. That's pretty much all up to you. And there's a lot of flexibility in that way. Because you, you get to read papers and you get to say, you know, this paper shows this. So I want to do that and build off of what we already know. So that's where the excitement for me really is in science. A lot of people also find research to be too isolating, and that's not really something you'll know until you're really in it, because you do have so much of the responsibility and the decision-making power that you're usually the only person who knows your project as deeply and as well as you do, right? So that's that's often very isolating for people, and that's a lot of the reason why some people drop out after a master's like they like science but they don't think that kind of single person working like hammering away at something is really for them so yeah definitely how you like your work life to be how many people and you know how much collaboration definitely should be something you take into consideration they use cryo electron microscopy and so you can be collecting images on your big microscope for hours and you know, alone, because you're, (laughs) there's, you know, no need for anybody else to be there, right? So that, that's a typical day for a structural biologist. Um, So you're completely alone. And then I think just in general, with your experiments, you're the only one doing them. And you're the, you're mainly the person planning them out. And so your day to day, unless, you know, you have some data, and you want to discuss it with somebody day to day, as you're actually doing stuff, it's very much you alone doing it um but I like that because I get to listen to audiobooks I I like being by myself and I don't like the simulation of constantly being on for other people so I really appreciate that but you know some people do find that lack of everyday people interaction um to be too too isolating Mm -hmm. so that's where I think a big part of extracurriculars and volunteering will be, be a big part and just how do I actually find too much stimulation tiring or do I find it isolating so for example I have you know the opposite experience um last summer with my I was doing my research a lot at home I'm actually very specific I actually need interaction with mentors and specifically I actually crave interaction with patients just because it helps me give some perspective on why I do what I do 
I definitely agree with getting experiences. So I definitely would not have have I wouldn't have had the conviction to make the decision to go into graduate school um, without having research experience, both in wet lab, like basic research, and in clinical, just to try it out, right? Um, and even experiences that are unrelated to your your academics or your career also great to have. Like I, um, I was a hostess at Red Lobster. Uh, <laughs> never makes it on my CV, but um, that really helped me figure out people really drain me. I do not like interacting with people all day. You know, so the, those experiences also are valuable in helping you learn about yourself on a deeper level. Um, actually, maybe could you tell us about some of your research that helped you that you like did uh, be prior before choosing med sc- uh, grad school? Because I was in neuroscience, every part of um, neuroscience research is in animal work. So I did animal work. Um, I did some in high school. I also did some right um, in, in my last year of university. Um, and that kind of, that helped me realize what kind of science I liked. So I did not like animal work because that's so complex. There's so many factors because you're working with a whole complete organism. So that's how I realized that I wanted to move away from something so complex into probably on the other side of the spectrum, like a protein, you're getting to the smallest, you know, molecules that, that have an impact on, you know, biological function. Mm -hmm. And so um, that was one, one, those are two of my research experiences I had. I also were, um, I also helped in a study in a palliative care context um, where they were trying out this this um, intervention for pancreatic cancer patients. And so I helped in delivering the um, intervention and in um, analyzing whether the intervention was helpful. Um, and that was clinical. I got to actually work with patients, um, got their interview data and comb through and figure out what was helpful to them, what their experience in that trial was. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was realized that I did not want to be around people or suffering, I guess. Yeah. Um, I mean, just a personal story of mine is I had cancer when I was younger. And so um, that was too much for me. You know, I don't think I could really distance myself fully because there's still that part of myself that still exists, you know, and those experiences. And so that was when I realized, you know, no, I I just didn't see myself thriving and being happy um, Mm -hmm. in that environment. So those were my research experiences. And obviously you take from each of them some new understanding about yourself and what you like, right? Um, So they're all very valuable. Yeah, thanks for sharing that for sure. Um, I think that's, I've heard that enough too. Like some things that hit too close to home are very difficult to do. So some people, it empowers them because, and they want to do it because it suddenly becomes even more close to the heart. And some people, I think more people actually find it too difficult. Um, And that's understandable. I also did like a clinical project where I was working with people with Parkinson's and it is, it is most beautiful. Like I still think very fondly of the experiences. Like when you talk to patients, they share all these like stories and entire lives and adventures, but um, part of the questionnaires I was doing this was talking about like how it changed their function, how it changed their uh, ability to take care of themselves and do things they loved. And I think I remember being quite sad that some of them were really big on travel. They didn't take part in like yeah. political issues or do all sorts of cool things. And it was hard for them to lose their independence from being highly intelligent, highly incredibly motivated people to um, being dependent on other people. Um, I think that is hard for anyone. I would It would be hard for me for sure. It is very heartbreaking, I think, mm-hmm. um, when you are there and you you see these people as entire rich people with lives and you can't really do anything about it, but you really wish you could. So, um, And something that I wish people, I wish maybe I had done more of or yeah. that people told me to do was to reach out to more alumni mm-hmm. or go to networking events. Because um, not only can you like find people who are directly in the position that you're thinking about being in. Um, Let's say doctors and asking them, what is your life like? Um, But you can also meet other people. So I did not know that there was such a, there is such a vast field um, of science stuff outside of medicine and outside of academia and research. Um, There are so many job titles that I just didn't know of that people don't really talk about. Right. So explore as much as you can 
can and figure out what your options actually are before you make a decision like, what do I want to do? What are some options um, besides research? I think there's this misconception that the only thing that comes from doing a master's or PhD is becoming an academic. What are some of the other career options? Yeah, there's a lot. So um, if you, there's a position called a medical chemist. So you're basically, you work in a hospital and you answer basically physicians questions about chemistry and how certain things interact. That was a pretty cool job. Never heard of. Um, There is medical science liaisons. Um, You can communicate, so you would work for a pharma company and you communicate with other, you communicate with clinicians um, and, you know, answer their questions about your products, your drugs. Um, There's also scientific advisors, um, kind of similar, similar vein to that. But um, there is, there's also a lot of healthcare consulting Mm -hmm. uh, or consulting in general, if you like that. Um, there's also a lot of um, health-related startups. So, for example, BenchSci is one that's in Toronto, and they help with antibio- They help with um, finding or centralizing antibodies that exist um, that different groups have created. And so, there are lots of those different specific um, jobs and uh, niches that um, where a lot of jobs for you know scientifically trained people exist, mm-hmm. um, but you won't know of them until and talk to people specific sources that you found helpful for networking or getting in touch with alumni in your field for u of t there's this thing called Ten Thousand coffees Mm -hmm. and so they have a lot of alumni join um and you basically fill out are you a mentor or a mentee what are what sorts of experiences are you interested in and then you can also look through every profile that they have in their server and find you know different people um, also LinkedIn, like if you, especially if you meet somebody of one company, you let's say meet them through, through 10,000 coffees and they mention, oh, I have this colleague who does this other position that you might like use them as a reference. Be like, Hey, I had a chat with X and she referred you. I was wondering if you would have 10 minutes to sit down and talk to me, you know, that's a really good way to like transition and figure out what you would like. For people that are UBC, UBC also has 10,000 copies. It's not that well developed the last time I was on it, but maybe it's a lot better now. There's some questions that you like to ask. Yeah. Um, I really like to ask what their day to day is like. Um, cause that's really important. And, um, I often ask what is something that you didn't expect about your role mm-hmm. that you learned after? Um, what are some things that maybe if you had the time to go back to when you were doing your master's, um, what were some things that you could do to prepare yourself better for this role? Summarize and spiral over everything we talked about. So, so far we've talked about like for you, like you initially considered it and then you had this dichotomy of like academia versus medicine. And then you, you know, through some of the different exploration and jobs you worked and volunteering that you did, you kind of found yourself feeling like some of these things about medicine didn't quite fit. And then also some of the cool things that you realize about uh, grad school were like amazing, such as like the freedom, the independence um, and all that really good stuff. And also the many career options from some of the networking you did. Um, So if you were, you know, talking to Amy of the time uh, of second or third year that was trying to decide like what to do and trying to explore yourself, what are some of the questions or like, you know, brainstorming and self-exploration that you would suggest? Yeah. Um, First of all, I would probably tell myself there's a whole world out there. Don't limit yourself to medicine or grad school. Um, So do some exploration for that. That's like number one, figure out what is actually out there. And then once you know um, what's out there and maybe you've narrowed down two or three that sound interesting to you, what are the other, like ask yourself between those options, what are what are what are the other things that you see yourself doing and how does medicine compare do you, do you does it seem like medicine is just calls to you more or less or um doing clinical research is probably a really good one um also doing other sorts of research or volunteering in different um positions that's always a really good way to get your foot in the door and just more experiences relevant or otherwise right um where you're getting paid hopefully um, because that, you know, that shows that you're being an asset that they're willing to pay you. Right. So those experiences are great um, just to learn about yourself. 
are you introverted or are you extroverted? I think that's a really big one. How much people interaction do you need? Um, Cause nature, but by nature medicine is people facing. Do you need flexibility and do you like being your own boss or are you okay with kind of being on call for certain times or being on the clock? Is research a viable option for you? Many people find it too isolating. Um, could you, you know, hopefully you've had some experiences now um, and really ask yourself, like, can I see myself doing this for the next two years? Let's say if it's a master's, can I see myself doing this for two years? Can I see myself doing it for five years? Yeah. Um, Cause that's all you really need to consider right now, right? You don't have to, when you're entering grad school, this is not a lifelong commitment to staying in academia. So don't think about it as like a huge decision. Um, really make a decision, see if you can be happy with it. And then, you know, uh, go on from there. Like you do have to put your life on hold certain years, right? Residency or if you're specializing, that can be a very long journey. So are you willing to make those sacrifices? For me, I wasn't. So that was, you know, that was an easy um, way to help me figure it out. Um, kind of have to know is just that nothing is permanent, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you enter into medicine um, and you really decide that you don't like it, you can always leave. <laughs> Nothing's really binding to you to it. Yeah. And it is still an experience that will be very valuable, right? Um, mm -hmm. If you go into a master's, and this is something that I will say about Canadian schools, you can often go into a master's first and then transition into a PhD without losing any of your research. So don't be afraid to go enter into a master's program if you're a little unsure. Um, if you go into a master's and then you realize grad school is not for me, you can graduate with a master's and apply for medicine. That's what a lot of um, my colleagues at work do um, when they realize they maybe made the wrong choice for them. So nothing is permanent and you're not closing any doors. So take that pressure off of yourself to pick the perfect decision. Cause you're really, I mean, as Shanna said many times, you're really not going to know until you're really in it. There's only like a certain level of, you know, thinking that you can do, but living it will be different. Um, so, you know, take some, have some peace and ha have some peace of mind and knowing that nothing is permanent and you can just choose what you think is going to be the right choice and then go do it. Um, Jill, who decided to do grad school first and then ultimately decided to med school. And it sounds like kind of a roundabout way of doing it, but she mentioned how it gave her actually the most peace to know that she had decided that this she had really ruled it out and tried it out and now that she's in medicine there's a kind of like a no regrets mindset I don't think you ever want to go into my, like med school thinking that I wish I had chosen the other thing I think you should definitely explore the other thing first before choosing medicine um, because you don't want to end up having you put in 10 years of training and you realize maybe you could have just like done that thing in the first place I really like your point but there's not a perfect choice Whatever choice you make, if you make the life that you're happy with, isn't that ultimately the perfect choice, right? You can't compare it against all the possible futures that you had. I mean, you could and call that your perfect choice, but that's not realistic. And I don't think you should aim for that. Yeah. yeah. Find, a, find a path that you can feel happy in, I think is what I would just say. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you feel about like now that you've made? Um, I really like research. Um, and I definitely antag like agonized over this um, for like I started thinking about med school in first year and I graduated in three years. So that was like basically two years of me just like, do I want to do this? Do I not? Like, you know, mm -hmm. I think it's very normal for people to not know and just be, rest assured that you're not the only one. Right. Everybody who has made this choice before you probably has had similar questions to what you're asking yourself now. And it's tough. It is tough. Um, but at some point you do have to make a choice and just have enough, have enough um, confidence in yourself to choose one thing and, and go with it and try to live it out and see, you know, I think you'll feel it if it's a wrong thing for you. Like Gina figured it out, she realized that all those things were not the right one and medicine is the right one. You'll find it eventually. Mm -hmm. uh, give yourself pressure that you need to find it now. Because I think that is just going to be counter counterproductive. You're going to stress yourself out and it's not going to help you in actually digging deep and exploring what you want. You can only make the best choice for you of the, of the right now. And your, your life can change 
when you're not, you're not expecting it to change um, because mm-hmm. suddenly you might want this whole thing and then things give you perspective. So um, you won't be able to plan because life will have interesting surprises for you in yeah. store. But I think it is also what, like how hardcore you want to be, even just seeing with my mentors in the exact same field, the way they decide to shape their lives is very different. So I have some mentors who are amazing, making amazing contributions in the world, but he spends all of his free time, all of his weekends, all of his evenings doing work. And that's okay with him because that just makes him happy. It it works for his spouse. Uh, yeah. And that's the way he shapes his life. And I have some mentors that have some more clearer boundaries on their work. They still work a ton, mm-hmm. uh, but they're a little bit more, you know, they want to spend time with their child, spend time with their spouse. So there's always a trade-off because, you know, there's a little like, there's a level of achievement you can make in your career or your, um, you know, the amount of research you can do on the side of being clinician. Um, that that's limited, but that's that's okay because that's that's like the choice, the way you want your life to be shaped. Answer who she told me about. I asked him, how do you manage to do all this research? Uh, you have your children, and he also has like a major hobby on the side. Like, like how do you make that work? Um, and he said he just is very at peace with the fact that he's never going to be like um, a Nobel Prize winner in research. He's also not going to be the best dad ever. He also thinks he's never going to be the best clinician in the world. It's okay because it's like good enough for him. Not to say he's going to be a bad father, but he says there's a difference between being the father who's there at every single soccer game, also coaches all the teams, also like, you know, bakes cupcakes for the whole team or something. Um, but, you know, there's like a good enough dad that is there to hang out with the kid after they had a really terrible game. And it's there's no such thing as the right answer for everyone, but it's kind of like being okay with just being average and like a good enough. His advice was that though, if you did want to be one of the best clinicians ever, you want to be one of the best researchers ever, then you need to consider not having some of these other things. So for him, um, some of his colleagues was, they actually realized belatedly that they actually wish they never decided to have a family because that wasn't a choice that was actually right for them. And they actually would have preferred dedicating their entire life to being an amazing clinician and that would have been more fulfilling. Thank you so much for taking the time to share kind of your thoughts and journeys. I love, you know, chatting with you. It's always fun. All right.